One of the many characters from Norse mythology that inspired Tolkien was an ancient legendary Danish king by the name of Frodi. I think you can guess whom we're referring to here. So let's find out his story. Icelandic chieftain and author Snorri Sturluson, in his account Skaldskoparmål, where he explains the origins of many complex metaphors or kenningar, mentions that one of the terms used for gold is the flower of Frodi, elsewhere the meal of Frodi. He goes on to explain the origin of this metaphor, where he fancifully links Odin to the history of Denmark and partially Sweden, as he often euhemerizes gods in his work, that is, he gives them a more human face also in the attempt to devoid them of their divinity. So, a son of Odin, Skjold, the founder of the dynasty, had a son, Fridleif, who in his turn had a son called Frodi. Chronologically, this would have been during Augustus and his Pax Romana. There are nevertheless some historical elements to this, like the trade between Romans and, uh, let's call them, proto-Danish speakers, with members of aristocracy forging their prestige also through the contacts with the Roman Empire, yet uh, a great unified land certainly did not exist at the time. Anyway, Snorri tries to draw a parallel to Christ in what he tells next and also prove how naive pre-Christians were in that they attributed this peace reigning in all northern territories at the time to this Frodi guy. We have a bit from the myth of the Golden Age here with no killings taking place, no thefts and so on. At some point Frodi meets King Fjolnir from Sweden and he purchases two slave women. At the same time, two gigantic millstones were discovered, which had the ability to grind anything ordained to them. So Frodi tells the slaves to grind gold and prosperity, and he gives them very short breaks, as long as a song, and they name the poem they are chanting during their work the Grota Song, from the name of the mill. Now, what they actually grind is an army against Frodi. So afterwards, a sea king called Müssing comes and plunders and also kills Frodi. Müssing orders them to grind salt, which they do until the ships sink, the seas flow into the mill hole and they become salt. These very precise details Snorri probably got from the Grota song from the poetic Edda, the main source of Norse mythology, Old Icelandic, which he cites after retelling this story. In the poem it is revealed that these girls are actually descendants of mountain giants and they actually shaped the grindstone themselves. But Frodi remains ignorant of their lineage, thus losing the seat at Hleidra in Old Norse, that would be Leira in Denmark. Historically, there might have been a reference here to the first leaders in Leira, also called Fredshoi, the Peace Barrow, by the way, having settlements dating back to 500, the earliest. Dated to about 650, the remains of a princely burial were excavated down by the river in a barrow called Krudehoi. Unfortunately, the man and his grave goods had been cremated, but a profusion of melted bronze and gold, as well as sacrificed animals, testify to his wealth. Snorri, however, interprets it from a Christian temporal and mythical perspective, and most probably there was a saga of the Skjoldung dynasty from which Snorri adopted this notion, as suggested by a 17th century paraphrase. This is not the only Frodi we know about, because the same author in the Ynglinga saga, the first saga from the cycle Heimskringla, links the piece of Frodi to the god Freyr, interpreted here as the king of Sweden succeeding Njord, in his turn succeeding Odin himself. Freyr and Njord being members of the Vanir family in old Icelandic sources, deities rather linked to fertility cults. Sometimes he goes back to considering these gods' divinities, not only people turn divine, when he states, for example, that in times of prosperity, Swedes thank Freud and the wealthier people get, the more they worship him than other gods. This happens in chapter 10, where Snorri seems to mix Freud and Frodi, because while he speaks of the peace of Frodi, he insists that the Sviar, the old Swedes, attributed to Freud, also called Ungvi, and his descendants, the famous Unglingar. After his death, he was carried secretly into a tomb and the people were told for three years that he was still alive, pouring gold, silver and copper through the windows of his mound. Even after people found out the truth, prosperity would continue as long as they sacrificed to him. In chapter 11, however, Snorri does place Frodi again in Leire in Hleidra, calling him Peace Frodi, while Fjolnir, son of Freyr, resides in Uppsala. 
And another fun mythical fact, Frothy set up in the story a huge vat of mead in his hall, and upon visiting him, Fjolnir, so his brother, got so drunk that he fell into it and drowned, according to a poet quoted here named Theodolf of Fynir, who, by the way, wrote a poem to King Rongvald of Westfold, tracing his lineage back to the Unglingar I mentioned before. So it was very important for kings to have their power legitimized by association with these legendary clans. There are also more obscure mentions, for example, a Frodi son of Danner, even a son of Harald Fairhair. Yet all in all, very likely, these two characters, Froer and Frodi, were based on a local deity, split into several versions, then turned more historical with the passage of time. This finds some justification by means of the poem Skirnismol, again from the poetic Edda, where Froy is actually called Frodi, so that would mean the wise or the prosperous one in Old Norse, and also in the manuscript Flatoyarbok, where uh, Swedes ascribed a golden age to Froyr and Danes to Frodi. Other sources mentioning him are the skaldic poem from the 10th century in honor of Hokon Jarl, written by Einar Skalaglam, stating pretty much the same thing, that no ruler had brought such fruitfulness and peace like Frodi. And we encounter traces of this tradition in Gesta Danorum as well, written by Saxo Grammaticus. Uh, he mentions several kings, in fact, but uh, Frodo III bears the highest resemblance to Ynglinga Saga. After defeating his enemies, peace reigns in his kingdom, and Saxo mentions the same example of good governance, leaving a gold arm ring in an open space whom no one dares to steal. His fame and authority coincide with the life of Christ again, almost said Brian here, but ends when um, a woman eggs her son to steal the ring. Trying to hide from his wrath, she turns into a sea cow and mauls him. For fear of a revolt, the Danes hide away Frothi's body in a cart they carry around for no less than three years. This reminds a bit of Nerthus mentioned by Tacitus in Germania, during which prosperity continues. Just like in Ynglinga saga, as a matter of fact. So from these sources, we can infer that Frothi definitely has something to do with a fertility cult, a remnant of the cult of the Vanir gods, historicized by later Christian authors. Now, how much does Frodo from Lord of the Rings have to do with Frodi? I'm not sure if Tolkien did have a deeper intention when choosing this name, as I can't really find a common ground, other than maybe Frodo in the story can be interpreted as um, a symbol of a restoration of peace and welfare in the Middle Earth. But then again, maybe this connection would have been enough in hindsight. So what's your take on it? Write your impressions in a comment below and hit the subscribe button for more on Nordic history and legend.